Welcome along to episode three of the Salt and Sauce Show. I'm David Simmons, and on tonight's show, I'm joined by a football writer who, no doubt, will have crossed paths with his column in the Edinburgh Evening News. He's on the show tonight to talk about his brand new book that's coming out. So he's going to join me on the couch right now, ladies and gentlemen. I'm David Simmons. This is the Salt and Sauce Show. And I'm joined by Anthony Brown. Yes, as mentioned, I'm joined by Anthony Brown on the couch tonight. We're going to be discussing his new book that's coming out very shortly. But first of all, Anthony, thanks for coming on the show. Do appreciate no it. So tell us a bit about your career, because I always remember reading your columns in the Edinburgh Evening News. Uh, you cover Hearts and Hibs games, and you've been down at Gretna as well and done games down there. How did you get into that line of work? Um, something that I probably wanted to do, I would say, from maybe 10, 12 year old. Just obviously a massive football fan. I was a Hearts fan initially. Um, just going to games and I was entering all these competitions and what have you on TV for Young Reporter of the Year. I remember Stockport v Middlesbrough or something like that in the FA Cup and I ended up, or the League Cup and I ended up writing a report on that and entering a competition. And I maybe got to like the last stages or whatever and I was pretty chuffed with that at that stage obviously because I was only 14, 15 or something. Um, anyway, so as I said, I used to go and watch Hearts week in, week out uh, with my mates on the sports bus. But I always sort of wanted to get into football journalism of some kind. And I used to keep little scrapbooks of Hearts seasons that I'd made up myself in, say, 95, 96, 96, 97. They've actually come in handy for research purposes for the book, bizarrely, just flicking through them and seeing exactly how things were back then. Um, and then 1997, 98 was sort of the last season where I would say I went regularly watching Hearts and didn't have anything to do with football journalism. And after Hearts won the Cup, I was just like, I don't know if it was just coincidence or whatever, but something in me, even though I was only 15 years old, I just thought, well, life can't get any better than that as a Hearts supporter. What's the point of going anymore? And my dad was sort of encouraging me to try and get into sort of doing some sort of work experience and what have you for what I wanted to do. Because I'd done work experience at the Evening News midway through that season when I was 15 through the school. Um, with David Hardy and Martin Dempster, and they took me out to Hibs and Hearts. So I'd got a wee feel for it then and then, uh, so part of the tug was I was watching Hearts every week and I thought, do I really want to give that up? Because I'm a 15 year old boy and you sort of love going to the games with your mates at that age. And this job advert came up on the back page of the pink and uh, I didn't even take charge of it myself. It was actually my auntie that got in touch with this guy called Keith Anderson who dealt with these seniors, which was Whitehill Welfare, Craig Royston, Spartans and all that. Yep. So my auntie got in touch with Keith and said, oh, my nephew's keen to do this. He's 15 years old. He's done a bit of work experience at the Evening News. And so Keith phoned me up. We had a wee chat on the phone and it was like, he says, do you want to go to Whitehill Craig Royston this weekend at, uh, at Rosewell? I think that was August 1998. So it was literally a couple of months after Hearts won the Cup. So straight away, I had this dilemma of I was absolutely buzzing about getting the chance to go and cover a football match, even though it was Whitehill, Craig Royston. It was like the World Cup final to me at that stage. <laughs> £10 a week, I'm sure it was they paid. <laughs> and I was absolutely buzzing. But at the same time, it was a bit of a wrench to stop going and watch Hearts because that's what I'd done. It was a sacrifice you had to make. Yeah. yeah and I'd, but my dad sort of pushed me. He says, no, nah, you, you can go back and watch Hearts anytime sort of thing. But this is an opportunity just to get your foot in the door. I think my dad probably thought that if I start doing that, I'll be editing the paper within a couple of years. And obviously it was never going to be that straightforward. But certainly that got me in, out of the routine of going to watch Hearts every weekend. I still went to watch Hearts midweek games and stuff like that. But um, in terms of getting into the mindset of working weekends and going to cover football matches, which I think for the younger generation now, that's a sweeping generalisation, but I think a lot of kids who are trying to get into journalism maybe don't understand that you have to give up your weekends and you have to give up your evenings sometimes to go and do this job and just give up watching your team at the weekend. Because yep. fundamentally, that's why people get into football because they love watching their team on a Saturday. Yep. But then if you do want to go and cover matches, you're going to have to stop watching your team and go and cover other teams in the lower leagues and what have you. So I did, I suppose, go out and got my hands dirty in the lower leagues and what have you. And then I did work experience at Daily Record later in 1998, I think maybe October, November time. And they then took me on this. Uh, so I was covering Cowden Beast, East Fife, um, 
I did them maybe for two or three years. But gradually working your way up the leagues from yeah, it to... felt that way. Yeah, because I did the seniors probably for about six months in total, maybe maybe a year. And I can t- I went back and did games here and there, even when I was doing stuff for the record. But I mean, getting in with the record that was a bump from ten pound a weekend to say I think it was forty five pound initially, and it's obviously gone up over yeah. the years. But I mean, even still going and covering Cowden Beath, I was dealing with Craig Levine when I was like sixteen year old because he was the Cowden Beath manager at the course, time. Yeah. And uh, that was a bit of a baptism because Craig, I subsequently obviously dealt with Craig more recently at Hearts. And to be honest, he was brand new when he was at Hearts to deal with, absolutely brilliant on every level. I've got not a bad word to say about him in terms of the way he was as a person. But at and Beast, I think he was a little bit sort of eager to make his mark and what have you. He was a new manager. He obviously had the fire in his belly and the passion and there was a few times he was maybe a bit off. And considering, looking back now, I was only a 16-year-old boy at the time and he probably overstepped the mark a wee bit in terms of the way he maybe spoke to me or what have you. But it was fine. I see it for what it is. He was a manager trying to make his way in the game. I remember, for instance, he pulled us up because we spoke to one of his players who had scored a hat-trick, me and the guy from The Sun. We spoke to a player who had scored a hat-trick and he was only 18, Murray McDowell, I think his name was. Right. And uh, so we've pulled the guy at full time. He just scored a hat trick for Cowden Beast in a derby against East Fife. And uh, so we're interviewing him, and Craig comes out on the Central Park pitch. He's like, What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> did you, Murray, did you get permission for me to speak to these boys? And so this poor guy, Murray McDowell's just scored a hat trick in a derby, and he's getting <laughs> yep. total dressing down for the manager. And then Craig Levine starts ripping into me and this other guy from the Sun. The other guy was a fully grown adult. so... I think he gave him it worse, but I still yeah. felt it. I was like, oh my I, God. I've had the pleasure of meeting Craig a couple of times and he has got that aura about him, hasn't he? To be yeah. a bit, that aggressive kind of person. Like you got, you got that feeling when he was a player as well that you wouldn't like to go into 50-50 with Craig Levine. Yeah, I mean, it, it probably was what an, a good thing in a way that happened to me at that early age. Because to be honest, I'm not the sort of guy who tends to get rollickings of managers or players. I've generally, if there's been any issues, it's all been discussed pretty amicably. I'd like to think I'm a pretty fair writer and I'm not this sort of shock jock that's going to yeah. incur the wrath of people routinely. So, But in terms of getting an early dressing down for a man like Craig Levine, who was one of my heroes as a boy, it was a bit of a sort of awkward situation and it, it did sort of probably toughen me up, I suppose, if a, foot, if a sports journalist needs toughened up at that <laughs> early stage. But to be honest, I'm, Craig, I must say, was absolutely brand new in his time at Hearts. I know a lot of Hearts supporters yeah. don't like him now because of the way the rain went, but honestly, absolutely superb to deal with. I found he's, he gets a bad rap. A lot of people don't like him. I can see probably why he has these personality clashes with people, but at the same time, I take people as I find them, and he was for me, he was absolutely brilliant. I really enjoyed sort of speaking to him, yep. even in difficult days when Hearts, there was a lot of difficult days in Craig Levine's reign more recently, and I'm talking more about his recent reign, not so much his first reign yeah. at Hearts. But he was he was brand new to deal with. And so I think having given you that first story, it's important that I stayed there. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Brilliant. You think that Craig was maybe a victim of his own passion because obviously with the whole Cathro situation, he had to somebody had to step in. And do you think he stepped in to try and be maybe too helpful that maybe backfired on him? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, when Craig Levine took the job on, I was all for it. I thought it makes sense because he was a great Hearts manager first time round. Yep. Again, a lot of people try and rewrite history. Got but he was a Leicester, good, didn't it? I mean, yeah, he was a really good Hearts manager the first time. and he, But again, he probably had that fire in his belly that he maybe didn't have second time round. He was a bit older and probably too wise for his own good maybe the second time. Yeah. And he didn't seem to have that... He liked a bit of mischief, but he didn't seem to have that same sort of fire in him that maybe he had... Do you think we'll see him in the dugout again for another club? Or? I hope so. I no. mean, I think it'd be a shame if a guy his calibre was to go out as the guy who yeah. built that Hearts team that ended up getting relegated because I don't think that's reflective of him as a manager. A lot of people would say it is because they remember the Scotland thing, which obviously didn't go well for him. Mm-hmm. But for me, he's a, he's a good Scottish Premiership manager, a very good Scottish Premiership manager probably a decade ago. Yep. And I think it would be a shame if he sort of legacy was defined by memories of his last absolutely. job at Hearts, if yeah. you like. Absolutely. So from Craig Royston, Whitehill, to Cowden Beath, East Fife, you soon found yourself covering Hearts and Hibs games. You must have seen some managers come and go in your time. <laughs> yeah, well, in terms of covering Hearts, sort of Hearts and Hibs regularly, I would say I probably started that in just before the 2012 Cup Final, because I covered that for the paper. I mean, it was sort of for probably from 2006 onwards, I would say I went from working in the Even News office at Holyrood, mm-hmm. sort of producing the paper, 
And occasionally the sports editor would say, oh, Barry Anderson was off or David Hardy was off the Hearts and Hibs correspondence. He'd say to me, could you go and do Hibs today? And for me, it was massive when that happened because I'd, although I'd covered Cowden, BC, East Fife, Gretna and what have you in the sort of early noughties, I'd never, I'd, the first Hearts game I covered was a friendly at Preston North End in 2006. And then I was starting to think, wow, what age would I have been? 24 then. And I really started to think, wow, this is incredible. I'm covering Hearts, the team that I used to go and watch. And I really, I've never taken that for granted. Even now, I still appreciate sort of the magnitude of that. Yeah. I mean, people say it's only Hearts that I'm maybe used to covering. No, but that's your boyhood team, like you say. Yeah. It's not even the fact they're my boyhood team. It's like, because I get the same thing out of Hibs, who are not my boyhood team, but I appreciate the size of these clubs and what they mean to people in Edinburgh and Absolutely. stuff. So that was never lost on me, even... A lot of people in the industry can get a wee bit sort of cynical as they get older and a wee bit sort of taking it for granted and what have you. And I've never, I'm pleased to say I've never had that. I've always sort of, uh, sort of appreciated what, like the opportunity to cover Hearts and Hibs because I know so many people out there would love that chance. Yep. And uh, in terms of going to cover Hearts and Hibs in the sort of the early period, I was, I was probably a little bit starstruck and I used to get quite anxious about it in terms of, if I had to do a one-to-one -one with a manager or a player over the phone or in person, I was not anxious, that's an overstatement, but nervous. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. It's you only know natural, isn't it? Like. So you're only human. And it, I still get nervous to this day, honestly. I still, like, if I'm doing an interview, depending on who it's with, I will still get the old butterflies and what have you. And, like, I think it probably is a good thing to have it. Just, it means you're sort of focused and you're, I guess, um, you're wanting to do as well as you can and you're mm. respectful of the person you're interviewing. But, um, I think probably in the early days, uh, John McGlynn, uh, who else? I, I didn't do too much in the Romanov era, to be honest. It was just sporadic interviews, so I wouldn't say I'd have any sort of major insight to that period. So who was in charge of Hearts when you kind of started? Was it maybe Lockie? Or? Um, yeah, John McGlynn, obviously, and I'd, I covered the 2012 Cup final. I'm trying to work this back the way. I covered the 2012 Cup final, but I, th I don't think I'd ever really covered sort of hearts day to day at that point. I think I was just on the fringes and because they, they went more pandy to the cup final, they sent every journalist they had basically. Yeah. So I got to do that and that was a massive thing because I mean, hearts hibs, I, the biggest sort of probably final, you'll, well, the biggest Edinburgh Derby you'll ever get, just the hype building up to that was incredible. And just to be sort of part of that is something that like no matter what else I do, that'll be a big thing in my life. Like yeah. that I was there on that day and interviewing players after it and writing pieces that I'm hoping people, oh, I know I kept all the 1998 stuff yep. when I was a fan and I presume a lot of Hearts fans will still have all the 2012 pullouts. So if a sporter pulls that out in 20 years time and says, oh, Anthony <laughs> Brown, that's, 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 that's a big thing for me. Yep. And um, so I think in terms of covering Hearts and Hibs regularly, I would probably say it was the sort of Pat Fenlon after the cup final for Hibs and John McGlynn going into Gary Locke, sort of. I was regular by the time Lockie got the job, and he's, you know, what Lockie was. It, uh, so. Was there any stories that you covered that you thought, wow, I can't believe I just done that. I can't believe I just wrote that story. Like, um, wow, that's an exclusive or anything like that that really sticks yeah, out for you? I mean, I wouldn't say I've broken any massive stories in terms of that are going <laughs> to yeah. set tremors off around Britain, but I think in terms of one that's resonated with the sort of wider public and what have you, and has almost driven the agenda for the next week. I would say probably the interview I did with Ishmael Goncalves, I think that was three years ago, 2017, 2018, um, just after he left Hearts, where he accused Hearts fans of racism. I mean, it was a minority, so I'm, yeah. um, I mean, everybody sort of will recall the story, presumably it was um, Ishmael was leaving Hearts and one of the players got in touch with me who was close to Ishmael and said, uh, is it okay if I pass your number on to him? And I said, yeah, no problem. So I just thought he wanted to do a routine sort of leaving hearts interview and just thank the fans and all that. And so we actually never got around to doing the interview for a few days. And so I had already earmarked something else for the paper that day, the following day. So I had all this stuff teed up and I was maybe going to use the Goncalves interview later in the week. Sometimes you'll do the interview and hold it for a couple of days if yeah. you've got something that's uh, less timeless, if you like. So I spoke to Goncalves on... It was, it was afternoon, it was quite late in the afternoon, two or three o'clock, and he just suddenly started giving me all this stuff about how he 
why he left Hearts, and it was he'd had um, he didn't feel welcome there because he'd been the subject of racial abuse. I, I'm paraphrasing what he said, so don't no, well, don't quote you on this. Years obviously, ago, yes, but basically <laughs> implying that um, there was racism in the stands at right. Tynecastle, and that was a big issue for him. And obviously, there was this. Uh, so straight away, I'm like, oh my god, I'm not the sort of person to buzz off that necessarily because yeah. I. <laughs> But he was telling you this in an exclusive kind uh, of way. Yeah, and I was like, oh, right, what do we do here? So obviously I had to get in touch with Hearts to give them the chance to sort of... Give their say on yeah. that, yeah. Um, and so we put the story out and obviously it was a massive story. It sort of banged and people were like, my God, um, big thing, obviously, racism in football. It's, I mean, it's something that... It's still talked about in other yeah, clubs yeah, to this day, isn't it? So. I mean, the, it's, it's a massive thing and it was... Um, so in terms of me getting it, I mean, I was on the news and stuff like that. I mean, that's not the sort of thing I want to be doing no. necessarily, but it's part and parcel of if you get a big story like that, people want to speak to you about it and where it came from. So in terms of getting something of that substance where it's a big news Exclusive story, yeah, really. that's probably the biggest one I've done. In terms of if you're talking about things that I enjoyed getting my teeth into and things like that, probably be the period of... Um, after Hibs won the Scottish Cup. I mean, then winning the Scottish Cup in itself was a massive story and I really enjoyed that as well. That was just incredible. And the thing that for Hibs winning the Cup, the thing that I really enjoyed about it was the, the pitch invasion. I know it's not <laughs> the right thing to say as a sports journalist because you're supposed to condemn it and all that, but I think that just made it so special. And I know there was a bit of a commotion and some people got injured and what have you, but I think it's one of those things that you'll look back on in 20 years' time and say, Wow, that was it was incredible. just a sheer overflow of passion, yeah, wasn't it? It you was. It. it was. There, there's always a clamour for folk to to be negative about something like that. But for me, that was what made that in a way. The, the pitch invasion. It was just. It was one of those moments. I remember just looking around, thinking, "What the fuck is going <laughs> on here?" It's, like, yeah. Yeah, I was actually thinking, if they come into the stand, this could all get a bit messy. But because we're in the press area, you just yeah. don't know what's going to happen. But it was just one of those, I cannot believe what's Serial happening moments. moments I, because these things happen in the 70s. They don't happen in our... Swinging from the crossbar oh, and stuff. <laughs> it was absolute madness. But And so I just had my iPad out just videoing it. I was like, what the hell is going on here? I could not believe what I was seeing. And I think Hibs fans get condemned to an extent about it. I think good on them. It was a, mm. a, they, they'd won the cup after all that period of time. It, was, it sh- almost signalled how big a thing it was that they... They went on the park because nobody does that in a yeah. cup final, really. You maybe get the odd couple of idiots that go on, but the whole support almost en masse. It was, it was a pretty remarkable thing to see. So there was that. And then obviously within two weeks, I think it was, Alan Stubbs had left Hibs. And of course. So I was covering Hibs right through that month. And it was just, it was really intense, but, but it was really enjoyable. It was probably the most enjoyable period I've had in terms of. Hibs winning the cup, then you had this period of is Stubbsy going to stay because there was speculation that he was going to move on, and there had been even before the cup final. And I remember straight after Hibs won the cup, we had to do a pull out, um, and I was trying to think, well, what can we do? What can we do? It's a little bit different here because everybody will be doing the same sort of things. And I thought um, I need to get somebody to try to say that Stubbsy should stay at Hibs and sort of or say he should leave, whatever they're thinking. I thought, yeah. who's the biggest guy that knows Stubbsy that's worked with him? I thought, David Moyes. Because I'm used to covering people that are round about Hearts and Hibs, maybe a few people, Rangers and Celtic, but David Moyes at that time, I think he'd, he'd obviously just left Man United not far before. So I thought, oh, I'll never get David Moyes, never get David Moyes. So I messaged uh, one of the guys at Hibs, one of Stubbsy's coaches, saying, who's, who's the best guy I can speak to about, about Moyes? Uh, sorry about Stubbsy yeah. and he says oh, D- David Moyes and I says how will I get in touch with him he says ping me his number and I thought uh, surely he's not going to do this because I mean I know some journalists speaking to David Moyes is not a big thing but this was pretty soon after the Man United, United job exit, yeah. and I thought he's never going to speak to us at Edinburgh even News about Alan Stubbs and lo and behold he was great he took the call he was he chatted away about Alan Stubbs he says Stubbsy a great guy and all this he should stay at Hibs and sort of build himself. <laughs> Lo and behold, he was off school within a week. <laughs> but uh, that period of sort of, um, the whole, probably the whole month right through into June, you had Stubbsy leaving. And I remember going down to Rotherham to see Stubbsy's, I'm calling him Stubbsy, but Alan Stubbs. Yep, yep. I've gotten really well with Alan, that's probably why I call him that. But, um, and I thought he was a really good Hibs manager. I know some Hibs fans were a bit disappointed they didn't get them promoted, but I thought he, he built that team that yeah. then went on and did quite well under Neil Lennon. So I was down in Rotherham covering his unveiling, um, him and John Doolan. And then that same day, the Neil Lennon stuff was starting to gather pace. 
So, was it right back up the road after that? Well, yeah, I was on. The, I remember being on a train. I was on the train from Rotherham to wherever you have to change on the main line. It was maybe was it York or Doncaster. So I'm sitting at York or Doncaster, typing up my Alan Stubbs interview from. And meanwhile, sports editor Mark Kack, I was at Ramsey, one of my sports editors was on the phone saying, Lenny Hibbs, is, there's murmurs of that. Can you check it out? So got in touch with his agent, got stood up that he was going for talks. And uh, so as soon as that kicks off, you're like, wow, Hibbs, Neil Lennon. I mean, even though Lenny was maybe not the guy, he, he'd just come out of Bolton, so he wasn't uh, sort of a guy who was at the very ah, top but yeah, he's still yeah. Neil Lennon yeah. Celtic legend Celtic manager sort of titan of Scottish football and I'm thinking surely Neil Lennon's not going to come and be the Hibs manager in the first in the championship so as it transpired he did become the Hibs manager I remember his his press conference it was like box office sort of stuff he had it was a roasting day at Easter Road and the uh, sun's beating down Lenny's in his suit and bright red <laughs> beetroot red just and he's having to do all these interviews I remember getting introduced to him and I was like I don't usually get starstruck but when somebody like Neil Lennon's coming in and you think oh you're going to be dealing with him for another year or two or however long he's going to be there you're like I oh, know this is good it feels good and I really enjoyed that period of just getting to know Lenny at the start and he was brilliant he was really good like he, don't get me wrong he could be quite sort of you didn't know what you were going to get with him but he was always He's got this reputation of being a bit of a hothead, and yeah, he, yeah. he clearly can be. But absolute lovely guy on the sort of human side when he's not sort of intoxicated by the football, if you like. Yeah. Like I, I won't go into it, but we, me and him had some nice chats and stuff away from the sort of day to day. So he was, I think, probably working with Neil Lennon at Hibs was a real sort of highlight of what I've done so far. Perfect. So we found out quite a lot about yourself, there, Tony. Um, now you've wrote a book. You've wrote a book called Reminiscing with Legends. The Hearts Exhilarating Journey to the Scottish Cup Glory, I'm all about the 1998 Cup win. Why did you decide to write the book? Well, as I touched on, obviously it was a period when I was going to watch Hearts, probably the last year that I would say, I mean, don't get me wrong, I still want Hearts to do well, my wee boys and Hearts and stuff like that. But probably my last year of being a proper, regular Hearts fan, if you like, and obviously it was a sensational season. And I've always wanted to write a book. It's always something that's been at the back of my mind. I've had a few moments where I've thought, oh, I quite fancy doing this or that, but it's never really... I think two things with writing a book, it's got to be something you're passionate about, passionate about rather, and something that you know that other people are going to want to, to read yeah. and buy. Um, and the other ideas I've come up with, even though there were things that interested me, I just thought, is there going to be a market for it? And nah. Um, so with this, it was very much a case of what have I done in my career so far or what has happened in my sort of football follow because I was only ever going to write about football really I mean yeah. I, I'm not I'm quite one dimensional that way I'm very football orientated um, so I think it would, if I was going to write a book it was always going to be on football um, so I'm thinking about the moments in my life that have been big that I've got genuine sort of knowledge or insight on and in terms of Hearts and Hibs career moments you go back to the 2012 Cup final Hearts beating Hibs 5-1 and as I said Hibs winning the Cup but mm. the one that just pulled me in was the I thought Hearts 1998 because I thought even though I was there and I know the whole story in terms of who played in the Cup final who they beat on the way I thought there's a lot of little backstories that I don't really understand little bits and pieces that I've sort of just maybe because I was only 15 at the time but I think I think even adults will probably not have maybe contextualised the whole thing at the time. Like how did that team come together and what was the... I just feel like there's so many different bits and pieces, different strands that all need to be sort of relived and brought back together and just confirmed almost. And you've pulled that all together in, in your retrospective. book. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, I'd like to think if you want to know about Hearts winning the Cup in 1998 and all the build-up to it in the previous few years, when I say the build-up, I don't just mean the, the week leading up to it. You're going to get all of the answers that you're looking for in terms of how that team, team came together, where all the players came from, what, what sort of guys were they, where did they come from, how did Jim Jeffries end up pulling all these guys together and were there any sliding doors moments in that where somebody could have gone somewhere else or something might happen that, yeah. knocked it off course and just the whole context of what it meant to Hearts, what it meant to all these individuals and I thought you've got 20 years 22 years to sort of reflect on that and I think I'm a big one on reflecting Like a lot of people aren't as I'm finding out with this book 
some of them had never reflected on this before in any great depth. And I don't know if it's just the way people are programmed these days, just it's all about the next thing, it's all about tomorrow. It's yeah. They're not either living in the moment or thinking about reminiscing. But reminiscing. Yeah. I love reminiscing. But it's yeah. something I've always been big on and even with my own career, I've, I've, I don't profess to have had a sensational career in what I've done, but it's something I always, I take pride from yeah, what I've done. Exactly. I've never covered a World Cup final, for instance, but even just things like covering Scotland games, I always look back and say, oh, that was, mm. I will take time to just sort of take stock. Right but I so, find mate. Right, right so. a lot of footballers don't tend to do that. It's almost like they've just been thinking about the next match, the next move, what's next. They've got that drive to keep going. Yeah. And I think I think you can have both. I think you can have a drive, but also like enjoy the moment as well. I, yeah, and don't forget. I, I found that maybe I, I think probably it's the case that a lot of people, particularly before social media, I think a lot of people just um, they enjoy the success and then they just move on the next thing. So you have your week of celebrations after the cup final. You go on your summer holiday with your mates or your family, and then you're back in for pre-season. And you go again, go and then you lose the preseason game, and all the feel good's gone from three months previously, mm-hmm. and then you get emptied out of Hearts on a for whatever reason, or you get sold by Hearts, and then you're away to Everton, or you're away back to Italy, or you're away back to wherever you're going. Yep. And then you meet a new wife, and then you're you're just moving <laughs> on with your life. It's That's like it. you never really in the past, get though. that chance to really enjoy. And I, I got the feeling that maybe I think probably a lot of the enjoyment comes from looking back or being asked to look back rather than maybe having that f- I mean I, I don't know I, I think if I won a, if I won a Scottish Cup as a player I would just You'd be killing everybody wouldn't you every yeah, week just, every day I, I I just find it I find it weird that people don't reflect and don't reminisce and try and I think it's a massive thing that makes you so I'm always like my mates used to take the piss out of me because I would send them like if we'd gone a stag do 10, 15 years ago I'd say oh 15 years ago today we were in Munich and Aye. this was happening and like I was a big one on for remembering things just remembering Aye. dates and what was going on at certain times and I just I just love thinking about the, the good old days and what have you and I, I think sometimes although the guys were delighted to do it um, I think sometimes they were almost a bit the, the doll, like some of them maybe hadn't taken that time out before to really sort of appreciate for what it was I, I think the, they had a reunion in 2018 and I think that was a big thing for them because that was like almost for a lot of them it was the first time in a, certainly in a good while that they'd all been together and so I think that was really good for them just in terms of coming back yeah. together and bringing it all back but for me I, I think a, a, some, a team that does I mean you could say about any club and any team that has success I think they should all make an effort to try and keep in touch with each other and even if they're not best mates just to keep those sort of memories like the, alive like the high school I mean. reunion but Aye. the cup reunion yeah because I mean these are the best moments of these guys careers and even if they don't feel like that necessarily at the time because they can't appreciate it on their CV when they're finished cup wins are what sort of define them whether the, the cup wins and international caps and title wins and things like that yeah so it's that time of the show where we cross over to our chippy of choice and here's how we got on this week. Welcome along to this week's chippy of choice. I'm in Sergio's in Bolton Hall. We're the only chip shop in Bolton Hall and I can highly recommend this one. I've been in here a few times. Mixed kebab that is unbelievable. Now look for Enzo, he's the man with the magic. Enzo, give us a wave in the background. Good man, pop it to see them any time, well recommend them. Sergio's in Port Hall is this week's chippy of choice. Everyone welcome guys and we welcome anyone, everyone. Please come see us. So you mentioned all the, the tales leading up to the cup final, Anthony, and how you're, you're going to have these in your book. How did you conduct your sort of research? Did you meet with the guys one to one and get their take on things? Or did you how how did you how did you get this the stories for the book? Um I think it helped that I had the sort of basic information in my own head, because obviously I'd Gone every, most, I think I was at every match that season, so I knew the sort of very rough sort of outline of the story, if you like. So that gave me a starting point. And to be honest, I didn't really have a massive structure at the start. I just thought I'm going to speak to everybody involved that I can get, basically, and see how it comes together. I didn't really have a, a plan of exactly how it was going to look in the book. I just I had all these targets of people that I wanted to speak to. I wrote them all down, and when I look at that list now, some of them are in it, some of them are not, and I've gone off on tangents and got loads of people that I didn't have on my initial list, just people that... A lot of it came from speaking to one person, he said, oh, you should speak to him, or you should speak to her. 
So a lot of it was that sort of thing. Um, in terms of getting the players themselves, they're obviously the sort of main interviews and what have you. So I've done interviews with them over the past sort of eight months, some of them on Zoom, some of them in person, some of them over the phone. And obviously they've been great in terms of if I need to check something, they've been great in terms of just phoning them back, getting a wee text here and there just to check other things. Because it's, it's very hard to get everything you want out of one interview. Yeah. And uh, you'll do the interview and you'll go back and you'll transcribe it all and then you'll say, why didn't I ask him about that? So you have to get back on the phone or... No, that's good, mate. I mean, because there was some players in that squad, wasn't there, in that Hearts 98 squad. I'm going to ask you about a few of them just to see what maybe you can tell us about them after. Don't give too many exclusives away for the book, obviously, but we'll start with Jim Jeffries and Billy Brown. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Hearts fan myself and I was at the cup final as well. What a day it was. I mean, these guys, what a job they did, Jim Jeffries. I mean, how did he come across in your research? Did he just let everything out or was he... Yeah, Jim was really good. He's, he's, um... he's quite a relaxed fellow he comes across, doesn't he? But... I believe he's got a bit of a temper uh, as well. He's, he's, by all accounts, he's got a side to him, yeah. But um, I think he's pretty mellow, pretty mellow now. But he's, uh, uh, he's, he's very good at sort of just chatting away. He, he was enthusiastic. He was passionate. You could tell it was something that obviously meant a lot to him. He was the manager. I mean, it's I don't know how that would, would feel to be the manager that did it. It's uh, and Jim doesn't seem like the most, even though he, he is. He, he, he understands the magnitude of it and what have you. In terms of expressing it, he probably wasn't as maybe sentimental as some of the players were in terms of, not that he wasn't sentimental about it, but in terms of getting the gushy side out of him, that was very hard. It was I had to keep probing to get bits and pieces out of him but just because it doesn't come naturally to him to to be that way, whereas some of the foreign boys in particular were very good at giving the sort of emotive side of what it meant to them. Whereas with Jim, he was very much talking about the actual what he did rather than how he felt. He was very, in terms of talking about how he felt, that was a challenge, trying to get him to... Open up. Aye. I, yep. I wanted to get, how how does it feel to be the manager that sort of did that? And that was very challenging. Whereas with the players, they were, some of them were able to do it far more naturally. And you could t I, I just got the feeling, Jim, in terms of opening up about his actual feelings was maybe reluctant, not reluctant, but just not accustomed to doing it. Yeah. It was more very much about what he actually did and how he how he built the team and the things he did that made the team special and what have you. And obviously he was able to talk about how it, like put it in context and how he views it and things like that. But it, nah, very, um, I would say the way he speaks, he's the sort of guy who has basic fundamental principles that I think could still apply to the modern game. And, we're very much in an era where anybody who's over six, anybody who's over fifty now gets branded a dinosaur in football yeah. just because they're, they look a bit older or whatever. Do you think this new role at Hearts suits him? Do you think it suits Jim Jeffries this new role that he's taken in at Hearts? He's like a what's his advisor? Actually? Advisor, to, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's a no-brainer. Yeah, I've, I mean, he's obviously done the sort of director of football role at Edinburgh City, so he, he knows what that involves, and he's. Uh, I don't think he's at a stage in his life where he necessarily wants to be a manager anymore. So I think this is the best situation in terms of he's obviously got a massive passion for Hearts. He's supporter, player, manager, and now he's come back as an advisor. And I think it makes sense on every level. He's he's a guy with the club's best interests at heart. He's sort of specialised in recruitment in an era where you didn't have all the sort of Y Scout and yeah. uh, DVDs and all that, but... I think he's got a natural sort of instinct of what's required. And sometimes that can get overlooked in terms of everybody wants to study the analysis and the data available and make their signings based on that. Whereas I think there's a lot to be said for just going with intuition. Yeah, yeah and, your gut feeling. Yeah, and I think that's probably been lost by a lot of sort of laptop managers, so to speak, that yeah. um, they're maybe just too obsessed with the data and not enough about their actual gut feelings and their, their own vibe. And I think Jim definitely worked off gut feeling and vibe to an extent in terms of the way he managed hearts or managed all the clubs he managed yeah. that. I mean, you can't mention Jim Jeffries without mentioning Billy Brown as well. How did how did Billy come across? Because he always, I, I've never really met Billy, but he comes across as looking from the outside in as being a straight to the point kind of guy, like a... Yeah, that sort of impul impulsiveness. I, I mean, I think I probably spoke to Billy less than I did Jim in terms of length of time, but I probably got just as much out of Billy as I did out of Jim because yeah. Billy, very, sort of, as you say, a sort of straight talker, a bit more blunt, lovely guy, really nice guy, and just sort of salt of the earth human being, if you like. But he's, he's just a sort of really 
Um, tells it like it is kind of guy. He tells it like it is. I, he'll call a spade a spade without being overly okay. harsh, but he's he's the sort of guy, if you want an answer to a question, he'll be honest. There's no sugarcoating it or anything. And I think the players probably appreciated that. They knew they would get a few rollickings off him because he was quite snappy and what have you. And he was the guy that took the training on a day-to-day. But they respected him and he was... I think they just seemed to know how to sort of manage players and keep them motivated give them a wee sort of bit of encouragement when they needed it and also they weren't scared to go through them when they had to I mean they they just Jim and Billy it's almost like one word that's like that's it. And you, anybody you speak to they just say Jim and Billy they don't say Jim they don't say Billy it's Jim and Billy it's like they're coming up here aye. Uh, I mean that almost never happened at Hearts though did it because they were doing very successful at Falkirk and then obviously the Hearts job come up and it was rumoured that Jim and Billy were going to go and it was rumoured they were going to stay did, did they mention anything about that side of things? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that was a really hard time for Jim because he was obviously a massive heart supporter and he'd always sort of had this ambition to manage the Well, yeah, he had, he'd had that man- ambition to manage the club from probably the moment he got on the management ladder at Ferradine and ah, Berwick Rangers yeah. in the 80s. Um, so obviously he'd done really well at Falkirk, good, so brilliant five-year reign there and Hearts had got rid of Tommy McLean, we're looking for a new manager. Jim Jeffries was the obvious one to go for in terms of and Hearts and Hibs generally tend to initially get linked to whoever the sort of rising star in Scottish football is. And at that time, it was definitely Jim Jeffries and Jimmy Nicholl at race. Um, obviously, Jeffries had the Hearts links and uh, he'd obviously continued to go to Tynecastle during that period where he was away working for other clubs as a supporter. So he had that connection. He was the, the sort of board members knew who he was and what have you. So when the opportunity came in to to replace Tommy McLean, he was the obvious guy to go to, and I think he sort of bowled them over at an interview. They he said exactly what they sort of wanted to hear, and they said, "Do you want the job?" And he says, "Yeah." So he committed to the job, and then uh, he went back and told his chairman at Falkirk, George Fulston, and George obviously put the guilt trip on him to an extent and started saying, "Look what you've got here." this is too good to leave, why are you going there? And started basically tugging on his heartstrings a little bit. But Jim's heart lay at hearts, basically. So yep. I think he sort of stewed on it for the weekend and thought, nah, I need to go to hearts, I need to go to hearts. And then Chris Robinson came back in and says, no, we know you want to come here. Come on. Because Falkirk had come out and said he's staying. Right. So I do remember that in the press. There was, oh, yeah. no, he's no coming to hearts. Oh, yes, he is going to hearts. Yeah, oh, no, he's no. It was knows. a big sort of announcement that Jim's staying at Falkirk. And then yep. he ended up Hearts wouldn't give up on him because I think they knew he, he really wanted to go there. Um, so he ended up going to Hearts and it caused a bit of a stir, Falk, a bit of a backlash in terms of the way he was maybe perceived at Falkirk. He'd sort of lost that sort of hero status. Although he still got voted, I think, manager of the millennium or whatever <laughs> at the end of it. So I think he was quite proud of that. But it was almost a sign that... Fans still trusted in him, even though aye. they're still got a bit of time for him, even though they hate him in the short term, sort of thing. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, that was obviously the the, the starting point of that team in '98. And I, just one last question on Jim and Billy. I mean, for the budget that Hearts had compared to Rangers in that cup final, he looks like say Loudrop, Alberts, McCoyst, all that, and Gorham and that sort of team. Jim pulled together a group of guys that was unbelievable for the budget that he had, wasn't it, compared to Rangers? That's the thing I think that's so special about that Hearts team. I mean. People say the Hearts team of 2006, in terms of my lifetime, the two best Hearts teams I can remember. I'm slightly too young to remember 86. Yeah. Um, and even then, I'm not sure the 86 team would be on par with the 98 team or with the 2006 team. The 2005-2006 team was obviously built on Romanov's money or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that that's what I think sets the 98 team apart, that they did it on a sort of proper non-old firm Scottish football budget as opposed to the 2006 team it was almost artificial because they were able to use Romanov's money to bring in all these players who ordinarily would have been out of their reach likes of Fisas, Jankowskis, even Scatchel. I mean even yep. though Scatchel had his best years at Hearts he had still played for some big clubs in Marseille, Panathinaikos before he came to Hearts so I mean these guys weren't coming in for peanuts they were coming in on good money and there was a lot of them. It was Brelli, Pospisil. I mean, they were all coming in on. Yeah. They were throwing money at these guys. Even the young boys at Hearts were getting yeah. a lot of money. In. 
I know we're getting a bit off topic here, but I mean, that that really could have been something, couldn't it? The whole Romanoff era, that could have really catapulted could hearts. Have <laughs> I, I mean, you look at the whole George Burley situation as well, and then the, was it nine games undefeated and we're sitting like t- near enough top of the league and we're actually, everybody's getting excited because there's a chance that we can actually split the old firm this season. Where do you think that all went wrong? Do you think it was solely down to Romanoff? I think I think the biggest what if moment in sort of hearts, certainly modern history, if you like, is what if Burley had stayed? That's the one that I think will always gnaw away. And because I mean, the, up until Burley left, they were absolutely flying. I mean that that short period at the start of the season, probably ten games, twelve games, whatever it was. That in terms of consistency over a period of three months, that was as good as you'll get with Harps. I mean, yeah. the 97-98 team, yes, they went the full season, but they probably didn't have that same intense blast that the 2005-06 team had in those August, September, October period under Burley. Blowing teams away. I mean, the, the beat Rangers at Tynecastle um, went to Celtic Park, drew 1-1, I think Scatchel scored the first goal, and you're, you're thinking, this team could win the league. Like, they were... With 98, I didn't really think they could win the league till probably after Christmas yeah. when they were still up there. I mean, I'm saying that, with, I don't know. I can't remember exactly what I thought at the time. But I'm, I don't think I thought before Christmas that they were going to win the league. Mm. It was probably more after Christmas. Whereas with that Hearts team, you're thinking, August, September, October, you're thinking, this Hearts team could win the league. They're, they're that good. They're, they've actually got calibre players now, which maybe they didn't have in 98. They had players that were growing at Harps in 98. Yeah. Whereas in the 2005-06, they actually had calibre players who were already, Fisas had played in the European Championship final yeah, two years previous, or right, one yeah. year previous. Um, Jankowskis had been part of the Porto squad that won the Champions League in 04. So both players had played in big finals the year before they joined Harps. And uh, the guys like Presley and Hartley were in their absolute prime. Craig Gordon was in his prime. Andy Webster. These guys were all just playing in the form of their life at that period. And it, they were Burley was quite a basic manager by all accounts, very much keep it simple. But he had something with that squad, he had them all pulling in the same yeah. direction. There was just something pretty special brewing. And I think as soon as he got the bullet, although they won a couple of games afterwards, it just sort of deflated everybody yeah. and folk were like, This thing's built on sand almost. It's yeah, it's those two words like you say, What if? Yeah, what if? Going back to the 98 squad, so we've touched on Jeffries and uh, Billy Brown. Um, we've got to start with the big man in goals, Jules Russo, the Frenchman. How is he? How did he put his story across on that day? Oh, brilliant. He's every time I've dealt with Gilles, he's just been brand new. He's like he's one of. The, I always think with, with foreign players when you're speaking to them and you've not spoken to them before, you're like, are they even going to want to talk about Hearts? Do they have genuine memories of Hearts? Um, and when I spoke to Gilles the first time, it was Gary McKay that put me in touch with him maybe about five, six, seven years ago, and he was like, oh, he's an absolute diamond. He'll be brilliant. He'll you know, what a talk away and what have you. And uh, every interview I've done with him, he's just, you can feel the warmth from the guy. He's like a genuine sort of... Big gentle giant. It's, I mean, it's easy for them to say that they're big hearts men because they're abroad and they don't come every week. But I think these are the sort of guys that would come most weeks if they were based in Edinburgh. I think, I was trying to imagine probably how they view hearts. And I think it's probably like, you know, when you go on holiday and you really like, destination and you sort of pine to be there when you're not there like yeah. for me it's like Lake Como I love going there right. And but you can't be there all the time but you'll go once every two years or whatever and just to sort of be there And but it's the memories so I'd imagine with these guys that's what it's like with Harps they, they remember it fondly and probably in far better light than it yeah. actually was in the real time just because they remember all the best bits and I think that obviously with the internet now they're able to follow what's going on and they, they know exactly what's going on now they they follow the news, they're able to pass comment on what's happening. They can tell you who scored at the weekend and what the vibe is with Hearts because of social media and the internet yeah. and stuff like that. So, they've, I mean, the fact they are still that sort of, you could probably speak to certain Hearts players from different eras and they maybe wouldn't know what's going on at Hearts now, who's there and what have you, whereas yeah. these guys... They're keeping tabs. Aye, aye. Totally. And the, I mean, Rusi is just fascinating. He's just, I didn't really know too much about his backstory beyond big name French goalkeeper who was really good at hearts. So it was really good just to dig down into all of that. I enjoyed that and just a lovely guy. Like yeah. just a really nice guy. One thing about that cup final that about Rusi, um he's coming on that after the mistake he made in the ninety six with Loudrop's cross that went through his legs. That do you think that played on his mind? 
in that cup final. Because Rangers did did batter us for a period of time in that final, and Rusi had a good game for yeah, what I remember. I mean, it, obviously that's a big part of the narrative. I'm not going to go into too much of that because it's in it's the book in a the lot book. of the stuff about his feelings. <laughs> By the book, you'll get it. Yeah, but um, certainly in terms of the narrative of Hearts winning the cup, I think that pretty much epitomised it because he was the goalkeeper that came in when Hearts were bottom of the league in yeah. October. 1995. I mean, that mistake's forgetting about after they win the Scottish yeah. Cup in 98, isn't it? I mean, his journey sort of mirrored that of Hearts in terms of he was at a low ebb at the time, came into Hearts when they were bottom of the league and just straight away he hit the ground running, played really well from day one and Hearts started to motor up the league, got themselves into the top half and then they obviously had that disastrous final against Rangers which was disastrous for the, for Hearts and disas- particularly disastrous for Rousset. And uh, I suppose it's easy to say how did he come back from that, but then you think about it, this is a guy that played for France, top level, played for Marseille, played for Lyon. I mean, these guys are not going to play for clubs of that calibre if they've not got the mental strength yeah. to deal with Mistakes that, that sort of adversity. Yeah. So, I mean, it, he knows it's a big big part of the narrative. He knows it was a big... I mean, it, it was a big part of the story that mm. you've got this sort of guy who... Absolutely balls it up in 1995 and any uh, 1996 rather than two years later he comes back and is the hero. So yeah. it very much reflected Hart's story in that period as Definitely. well. Definitely. I mean, over the years, Hearts have had decent goalkeepers. Maybe not so much recently with Joel Pereira, maybe, but the likes of Craig Gordon, the Emmy, even John McLaughlin have mm-hmm. all been good goalkeepers. Where do, where do you rate personally, Rusi, in with them? You're definitely up there. I think. He'll always have that. It's a shame. It shouldn't be like that, but that, that, that shadow over him. Yeah. slightly will sort of always be there just because it was such a big game. And I think there probably is an element of people that think Rusi was a dodgy keeper because of that moment. But the reality yeah. is he's probably up there as, in my lifetime, you would, those guys you reeled off, but certainly in the Emmy, Gordon. Henry or, Smith even. Henry Smith, Jamie McDonald was a good goalkeeper, yeah. maybe not at that level. But... Um, Certainly, Niemi and Gordon, top top class. I would have Rusi just beneath them, probably right. in the in the pecking order of what they were at Hearts. Certainly, I didn't see him in his prime in France, so I can't comment yeah, on that. But definitely in the Hearts top mm. three um, in our lifetime, anyway. Yeah. Um, moving on to Stevie Fulton, big mm. Baggio. Now he was captain that day because Lockie was injured, wasn't he? He was. He went down after two minutes and won us the penalty. But uh, we Mickey put away. Do you think he took a dive? I watched it back mm. in preparation for this interview. It's soft, <laughs> it's soft, but I don't, he's adamant it wasn't a dive. And I, I think there's definitely contact from the two, yeah. or certainly from at least one of the Rangers players. I remember his bleach blonde hair in that final. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I don't think it was a dive. I think that any Dubai about it would be whether it was in the box or not. That's probably more of a, a complaint from the Rangers side of it, is whether it was in the box. And obviously, Willie Young's become a sort of cult hero among Hearts fans because he, he gave that penalty and didn't give the Rangers one almost at the end but um, in terms of it being a dive I don't think it was a no. dive personally I remember that I was running late for the game and I was just walking up the stairs at Celtic Park behind Rusi's goal at that time and I've literally just seen him go and the whistle go and the whole place erupt that's a memory that will live with me forever I mean 1998 I would have been what 14 years old and I'll never ever forget that day, that moment. That was unbelievable. There was just, as they say now, limbs flying everywhere. It was a perfect sort of cup final day because of the weather. I mean, that, it was roasting. You win a cup in rain and it probably doesn't have the same feeling, but that, that was a cup final is supposed to be sunny, even though it's May. You, you sort of yeah. associate cup finals with sun. And in terms of the heat, was absolutely blasting that day. It was roasting. It was, yeah. it was proper sort of magical cup final weather, the perfect day to do it. In terms of, from Hearts do you think Fulton was a bit underrated as a player? Maybe because he's built. I mean, a lot of yeah. people gave him abuse of being a I, bit I mean, flat or whatever, if you like. But what a player he was! Ah, he was a great player. He was um, technically superb. He was he was almost like the little string puller, if you like, in that in the midfield there. His passing range was magnificent. And just really lovely left foot. I mean, even when he, I think it's a sort of myth that built up that he wasn't that he was some sort of loose cannon and what have you, or he maybe wasn't a, a great character in the dressing room in terms of his attitude and what have you, but I didn't really get that impression from speaking to the other guys or from speaking to him. I think he's sort of a very sort of sensible guy when you speak to him. Very right. sort of straight. Because I mean, there's stories about like weekends in Benidorm and Magaluf. Uh, you know, I think, I think we're drinking him, he could be a bit of a loose <laughs> cannon, but in terms of his, uh, his general sort of what he brought to hearts, I think he was quite a safe player in terms of Jim Jeffries had him at Falkirk. He took him at Hearts, played him for 
five years mm. consistently and then he took him to Kilmarnock so I think that probably tells you all you need to know yeah, about it's obviously highly rated in Jim's mind yeah um, I mean that like you touched on that maybe being a bit of loose cannon is that something as to maybe why Hearts did so well that season like that team bond in that team dressing room when you look at characters like Fulton like Gary Locke I mean Jim Hamilton Jose Cotongo like mm. what a changing room that must have been the banter in there the team spirit do you think that played a big part in that win that yeah, season? Yeah, it's a big thing. I think I think the other thing to do with the team spirit is that, unlike probably today, it was a very tight squad in terms of most of the boys were playing, or at least on the bench. I mean, whereas often you'll get a big squad to now where five or six of the guys are not even getting stripped at the weekend, so they maybe don't feel as part of it. Yeah. Whereas with that Hearts team, I think everybody was part of it to an extent. They'd either played at the start of the season, they were coming on regularly off the bench. Guys like Grant Murray, David Murray, for instance, were the young boys were getting a wee look in and even like Jose Katongo, who you'd maybe say is a fringe man, but he was coming off the bench most weeks. And obviously they are, as you say, good characters and in terms of they like to laugh and they were they were tight. They were close knit. You had the foreign boys, you had the young Scottish boys, you had the sort of guys like Dave McPherson and John Robertson and they all just seemed mm-hmm. to blend. They seemed to bond nice and had a good they all had their own ways, but they meshed together very well, both on and off the park. Yeah, I mean, there's kind of a similarity between that and the the five one Hearts winning team. When you look at that changing them as well, I mean, Lockie's on there as assistant manager, and um, you've got like Ian Black, Gowser, Scatchell, Craig Beatty. Mm. Um, I mean, there's a kind of similarity there if you ask me. The teams, but I think that that's a big a big must in a team. Yeah, I think camaraderie's. A, I think most Scottish teams would need that sort of camaraderie to to do well. If you like, I don't know why, but. These characters. It, it, you maybe almost it's almost two separate things being athletic and playing as a team but yeah. I think having that togetherness off the pitch is a massive thing and obviously having big characters who like to laugh and I suppose making it a happy place to go to your work I guess it's yeah. pretty much it's essential, training fun it? doesn't it yeah. um, do you think I mean it's getting a bit serious now this is a debate that I've had with friends before do you think maybe the whole academy system in Scotland now and anywhere are, are kind of pulling these players out like your Stevie Fultons and like maybe a Ian Blacks so that are maybe slight bomb scares and no allowing them to develop through to be a senior player or there's definitely an element of that yeah because I think I mean I do the coaching myself from a wee boys team yeah, I mean, can you imagine Stevie Fulton as a young kid going round yeah. two footing boys and putting them up there and I do, elbows and I do I find I, I'm coaching eight year old boys and I'm I'm not judging their football ability but I'm also I'm, I'm sort of judging their attitude like some of our best players are total mates I shouldn't say this. No, it's all right. No, no, no. They're, they're hard to hard to coach because they don't concentrate very well and they like to mess about a bit. And yep. you're thinking, these guys could easily lose their way just because they're not quite as good at the training as some of the boys who are nowhere near as good at them football-wise. Yeah. And so I definitely think there is an element of that that they could, t- I don't know, scouts could turn up on a day when your best player's fannying about That's and what a, have you and just yeah. not at it and you would presume that they will grow out of that at some stage but by that point they might have missed the boat so there's definitely an element of that there's good attitudes like it or not it does help you go a long way like the amount of players that the amount of guys I play football with who are very good footballers and maintain that they're better than guys who made it professionally but they had a better attitude Mm -hmm. I think it's, definitely it's hard because you you know what it's like. Everybody's different when they're 12, 13, 14 year old, even 18 year old. Like, yeah. I didn't really feel I properly grew up till I was in my 30s. And I'm thinking, <laughs> of, like, in terms of becoming mature and having the proper outlook mm. and the proper attitude. So, I, there will definitely be a lot of players that fall by the wayside just because they don't have the right attitude in their yeah. early years. Academies are looking for more the Lionel Messi finish well, they're article. They're looking for then. guys at eight and nine year old. And yeah. I mean, I look at the boys' club and I. I could take a punt on the two or three guys that I think might make it, but I couldn't be certain yep. at this stage that there's not another boy who's just going to be really dedicated for the next 10 years. and Kick on two or yeah. three years down the line, exactly, yeah. yeah. So we've touched on uh, Rousse, Fulton, uh, Gaffer himself, the man who bleeds me and Gary Locke. He must have been devastated when he got injured and knew he wasn't going to make that cup final. He, do- he doesn't say that. He's... Uh, well, he was part of the big day, wasn't he? Obviously, and he aye. contributed, but... I, th- I think... Is- you never really hear people saying that I was absolutely devastated to miss it in the sense that it eats them up. Yeah. They say they say they were gutted to miss out, but you never really get the depth. It's, I think uh, I've always said if if I was to miss out on something like that and not get another chance to make up for it, that would niggle at me. It would really annoy me. So 
I don't know, maybe it's because I've never been part of a professional team that I can't imagine putting the team first almost and mm. seeing the happy side of the team. But I would I would very much, if I was Gary Locker, John Robertson, I think it would really annoy me that I didn't play that final, more so than actually enjoying the final, if you know yeah. what I mean. We'll come on to Robbo in just a bit. Um, do you think Lockie maybe made up for missing out on playing in that day by being in the dugout in the 5-1 game? Because he was such a huge part yeah. of that changing him, wasn't he? Yeah, he takes a lot of pride from that. He's Rightly so. Yeah, I mean, he, I think he felt, because that was a derby against Hibs, he had a really good record as a player and as a manager against Hibs. And I think he felt that Paolo Sergio sort of lent on him quite heavily in the build-up to that, just in terms of what will this game be like. And and Lockie got a lot of information. He he managed to get the Hibs team. Um, yeah. I won't say who from. I think that's a big sort of secret out you there. You tell me off here. Everybody's <laughs> guessing who, who he got the, the Hibs team off. Um, but he, he managed to get the Hibs team. He obviously was a big part of the set pieces and Hart scored from yep. at least one set piece, maybe two. Um, so I think he takes a lot of pride, probably more pride from actually being a part of that than what he did in the 98 final because he actually didn't play on the day. Mm. So, um, yeah, I mean, he he got his, he's not got any medals, I think, that, but he's got the, the memories of being heavily involved in arguably Hart's yeah. two greatest days of the last, well, certainly since the 50s. Absolutely. I can imagine his, his passion wearing off on the players. The passion that his team talks and the way that he must have motivated the players on that day. I can imagine that wearing off on the likes of Ryan McGowan and Ian Black and that just to get go that extra yard. No, definitely. I mean, a lot's made of tactics and all that, and it has to be. I get that. It's a very sort of sophisticated game now, football, yeah. and there needs to be that tactical side of it. But see, I still think there's a massive place in just basic motivation, man management. And, Somebody like Gary Locke, he obviously knows the game. He's maybe not Jurgen Klopp in terms of tactical abilities, but he understands the game. He knows what needs to happen on a football pitch to win a match. He knows where people are falling short. Yes. He understands the fundamentals. And the key thing with Gary Locke is he's a really sort of charismatic guy. He's an infectious guy. He's, yep. You sit down with him and he, he'll just gab away. But he's quite engaging to listen to. He'll just He's always got a story or a, a sort of mindset, some sort of way of articulating something that you want to listen to and he's just he's just a nice guy he's the sort of guy that you would you want to do well don't yeah, you he's passionate he's he walks into a room whether it's in a bar whether it's a, he, he's got time for people as well he's a, he's a proper man manager he's not going to fall out with people for no reason he's just the sort of guy if I was in a if I was ever to become a manager I would look to get a Gary Locke type guy in my backroom staff if not as my assistant then certainly as a coach because somebody like that is just going to help the dressing room, help I mean, the changing room. He's got an ambassador role at the moment at Hearts. Do you think he'll ever go back into management, whether that be at Hearts or elsewhere? Do you think has he ever given that? I think he was, to you? he was a bit scunnered with the way things went after leaving Hearts and this sort of perception that built up that it was him that took Hearts down. I mean, I think that bothered him because I think anybody with a brain can see that yeah. he didn't take Hearts down. It yeah. was the the restrictions that he was working under, the points deduction, but people sometimes can't see beyond that and they just see yeah. a team getting mashed on the park and think he's tactically inept and all this and but he had no options he had young boys who weren't equipped to play in the in the first team at that time most of them and that's been proven by the levels of all subsequently or the majority of them have gone on to play at most of them have gone down the way apart from Patterson Walker and possibly Nicholson mm -hmm. yeah. um so he was a bit sort of scunnered by the way that went and the obviously getting emptied by hearts at a time when um the change was happening when Anne Budge was coming in, Craig Levine was coming in. Mm -hmm. He obviously went to Kilmarnock and that didn't go well. And to be honest, he had a pretty bad run of it in terms of Kilmarnock, Wraith Rovers and Cowden. And then when you end up managing Cowden Beast, it's okay if Cowden Beast are your first club and you're working the way up. Yeah, yeah. But I think when you go from Hearts to Kilmarnock to Wraith Rovers, Cowden Beast, you're on a downward trend. And I think Gary knew that. Yeah. And he's thinking how do I get back up? You, you have to perform minor miracles to get from Cowden Beast back up, having had a few bad jobs or, or a few bad runs, if you like. Yeah. So I think he certainly, when the opportunity came to get out of football and take on this ambassador role where you weren't getting judged week to week, I yeah. think he saw it as a bit of a relief, to be honest, just being out that sort of firing line and getting your name called out as being a, a dud manager or whatever week to week. I think he probably found that a bit of a relief at the time and there was certainly a point where I think he thought, I'm finished with management. 
Right. I've not actually spoken to him recently, so I wouldn't know for certain whether that's still his mindset. I mean, I dare I say can if, imagine if Hearts half yeah. offered him the job tomorrow, he'd be in there <laughs> like a flash. But yeah. um, I'd like to see him get another shot at it somewhere, even if it's in the lower leagues, just because I think he has got something to offer. I think he's definitely... He's, he's got a really good sort of infectious personality and understanding of the game. So I'd like to see him go back in, sort of refreshed and make a go of it somewhere. But if he's, I don't know, you need to ask Gary if he yeah, has any I'm, I'm sure he's loving his role being back at Hearts, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, he'll just be glad to be back in at the club he loves. Uh, another player to touch on is Stefan Adam. Stefan Adam obviously scored that vital goal. He scored two in the semis against Falkirk. That goal, the second one, when it went in, I mean, I remember it was absolute euphoric. What, what, what's your memories of that goal? Do you know, I, my memory, I find it hard to actually memorise how I actually felt at that particular moment. I don't know what's a real memory and what I'm remembering because I've seen it on the telly. Yes, exactly. So I, I, obviously, it was a good feeling. You would have been going mental. But mm -hmm. I can't specifically remember. I remember exactly my uncle took me to that game and I remember my uncle picking me up and literally throwing me in there. Thankfully, he caught me. That that's just I would, it was the fear of being picked up and thrown, but everybody else was doing the same, yeah. and it was just absolute euphoria and craziness. And and did you speak to Stefan about the book? Did you speak to him yeah, yeah. personally? Yeah. Spoken What's to his the... sort of memories of it? Does he? Uh, he's got quite vivid memories actually. He he was one of the he was able to sort of reflect in quite good detail about the sort of the events of the build up and the actual game and what have you. Um, I mean. It's the moment that sort of defines his career, isn't it? He scored the, the most significant goal, arguably, in Hearts' entire history. So he's he's proud of that. He's he's a still again another massive Hearts man. He sits with the Hearts strip on in France. And yeah, I mean you see it on Twitter. I follow yeah. him on Twitter. Like said, he's, he's posting about Hearts and he's sticking up for Hearts if anybody's putting them down. Yeah, he's, totally. It's good to see foreign players that have been to the club still do things like that. Again, a, a lovely guy as well. I think that's the the thing right throughout this team. They're all good guys and just nice people people that you want to speak to people that you probably want to be associated with your club if you like yeah and moving on to another striker obviously probably the king of hearts if you like John Robertson it was his last ever game in a hearts jersey as a player mm. did you speak to Robo what was his thoughts on that day how did he feel obviously he, he did come on didn't he for a short no he, no, he never come on no. he never he never I do apologise but he was part of the squad he was part of the squad unused substitute so it was um, I didn't actually get Robo for the book he's the one uh, him and Grant Murray are the only two that I've not got in terms of right. significant people. I've got everybody who played, um, but Robbo wanted to leave it to the guys who played, which that's, is fair that's enough. It's, testament to the kind of person he was there. Um, so I think he's thought I've sort of, I've had my moments in the limelight. Like, this is Stefan Adam's time. This is Colin Cameron's time, sort of thing. So, um, in terms of his, I just find it fascinating that you had this absolute giant of hearts history, entire history, not just the modern history. This is one of Hart's most important, greatest players, arguably. And he's, Hart's career has just come to an end at that very moment where they've had that moment. I mean, he he was obviously part of it because he was in the dressing room. He was, he was in the dugout. He was on the bus. He was there. He was a Hart's player. He got his medal. But I just, again, for me, I just think it's, there must be a bit of niggle there that he's not quite even just getting on the pitch. I mean, uh, Robbo was a guy that wanted to make a difference for Harps. He, he was a team player, but he was also the guy that thrived on scoring the goals and digging Harps out of holes and winning Edinburgh derbies. And just, I, I just think it's, I mean, for such a giant to have had such a diminished role in that cup final. Didn't seem, it, didn't it, sit right, did it? It, didn't it, seem it depends right. how you frame it, because you, you look at back and he's jumping about like a madman as if he ah. played so I mean he may well be absolutely comfortable and the applause it. he got walking around to the fans yeah. as well I mean that kind of spoke for itself yeah and, and I mean you could argue that he was lucky to even still be there at that point because he had been a substitute in the 5-1 game two years previously yep. against Rangers and he'd basically been a fringe man throughout that 97-98 season so there's an argument that he possibly shouldn't even have been on the bench yeah um, so I suppose it depends what way you look at it whether you think it's great that he was involved or it would have been so much better if he got on the pitch yeah. one thing about that cup final as well that I just want to talk to you about is uh, Neil Poynton's uh, home video that he made of that day have you, I take it you've seen it Neil Poynton yeah <laughs> I've watched through every minute of it just to <laughs> see if I can find little nuggets that need explored because that, that is rawness and it's purity isn't it yeah it's, it's great because I mean you'd probably be more inclined to get that sort of thing now because everybody they've got their social media Smartphones, guys etc yeah 
press officers are on the bus these days and what have you and recording everything. Like every cough and splutter from the players is getting filmed these days. Whereas back then it's that's unheard of to not unheard of but very rare to have that sort of a camcorder walking around aye, recording. A player in the dressing room recording it very rare and it was all as you say, raw footage. A lot of the stuff is well, some of the stuff certainly they would rather <laughs> didn't come out. Yeah. But we'll not we'll not highlight that. I mean obviously I have got to just in case anybody's sort of You've got to contextualise that and the fact that it was in the 1990s. Of Things course. were slightly different and what have you. But even still, it's the, I guess that was before an era of social media, so they would never have thought for a moment that... That would become available on a global platform. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So Hearts win the Cup, they're back to Edinburgh and the celebrations are crazy. There's a quarter of a million people lined Gorgie Road in Edinburgh for the bus coming back and the players were out on the bus roof. Not an open-top bus, an actual mm. coach bus did were you part of that parade were you were you there watching I was, the bus? I was there on the goggy road I, I think this, the big thing about that i think is um certainly i remember feeling this and a couple of people i spoke to have also said it when hearts won the cup and you're coming back from glasgow obviously you've had that euphoria in the stadium and everybody's hot and knackered because you've had this day of celebrations and you know what it's like when you get back on a sporters bus after a game it's a wee bit more low-key because everybody's knackered yeah and the people who have been drinking are starting to feel the effects and what have you. <laughs> so I think there was a feeling of what actually happens now. We've left the stadium. Where do we go? What do we do? Like, um, I mean, I was only 15. I didn't drink at the time. I would have been going to stay at my granny's at Liberton Bray afterwards. Um, so I think it was very much a, what do you do? Do you go to your local hometown? I mean, for older people, it would be, do you go to your local pub or do you go to Gorgie? So there was almost this, um, in the... Even news on the day of the game, I found this little advert that says there will be no official celebrations at Tyne Castle. If Hearts win the Cup, it will be tomorrow yeah. at the Open from the Mount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, obviously there was nothing planned for the Saturday night. It was all very impromptu. People just thought, I need to congregate at Tyne Castle. Hearts have won the Cup. So obviously masses of people decided instead of going home that they would go to Tyne Castle to sort of welcome the team back. And I don't think anybody was braced for what actually happened. There was no trash barriers up in the street. There was no uh, the police. There were police there, uh, but there was no uh, barriers up the sides. People were just clamouring into off licences, climbing up on bus stops, climbing up on traffic well, Health and safety would have a field day. <laughs> and and uh, I think you just didn't really know what you were waiting for. Were you, you were waiting for a bus to come and wave at them, and then suddenly the players come along and you see they're on the roof. You're like, <laughs> what the hell's going on here again I can't remember it vividly I can't remember the moment I first saw them if you like I just obviously you've seen all the pictures since and it's become ingrained in your memory but I can't actually remember how I felt at that very moment like the very first time I saw somebody on the bus Yeah. but certainly I mean that you don't see that like I've never seen that anywhere else yeah. so I take it in your book have you got um, stories about um, obviously I'm not going to actually tell them because we need to buy the book to read it but have you got stories about like that journey from Hamden back to yeah. oh yeah there's, the a, whole, there's a whole chapter on the on, there's a whole chapter on the celebrations like literally from full time right through the next week so it's all sort of detailed in there what what it was like where what they did what, what happened and what the vibe was with players on the bus, supporters off the bus and just everything that sort of shot off from that, if you like. Well, I've, I've loved speaking to you about this tonight, Anthony. Um, what, 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 sorry, where can people buy the book and when? Um, it's released on the 4th of November, but you can pre-order now. Basically, the pre-order window opened about a month ago. Um, it's all being sold from a website at the moment, so you can buy it in hardback or paperback and you can get it at legends98.bigcartel.com. Um, you'll find that on my Twitter feed, which is at Anthony A. Brown. And you can basically follow, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you'll get all the sort of updates about when it's when it's coming and any further information you need. But yeah, you can pre-order now um, in hardback or paperback online. And it'll be delivered on the 4th of November. Yep. Perfect. What a great timing for a stocking filler for all you Hearts fans out there. It's been an absolute pleasure on the Salt and Sauce Show for episode three. Thank you very much, Anthony Brown. Thank you.